Alrighty, so I'm going to start uh, well with, uh, um, I already told you what are the microcosm functionals, so let me just start with uh, defining what's the classical theory then. Classical theory. So we take this space of macrocausal functionals and equip it with uh, the bracket I gave you. Uh, I probably did not say that the bracket has a name. It's called a pious bracket. Bracket. So it goes back to uh, a paper by Pius from 1952, uh, where he proposed this for completely different reasons. Um, I found the book of Humander in the coffee room in that little library. So if you want to find out more about multiplying distributions, uh, it's there. And the relevant theorem is uh, 8.2.4. So please have a look if you're interested. <laughs> um, all right. So let's quantize things. This is classical theory, but obviously we are interested in quantum theory. So this is the third part of the story, quantization. of the free theory. All right, so uh, how do we want to do this? I'm going to use deformation quantization idea. So deformation quantization. should uh, be consistent with spelling. And uh, what does it mean? It means that I want to introduce a product, so a product star on this space of microcausal functionals from a power series in H bar. So I should add here formal deformation quantization uh, such that it uh, quantizes the bracket. So first of all, F time, well, sorry. So F star G at the order H bar equals zero should be F pointwise G, so recovering the product. And then the commutator, so F G, star commutator at order h bar equal one should be uh, the bracket. So the bracket f with g and uh, I want an i also. Uh, that's, sorry? Was a question? Yes. That's uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, this this is uh, yeah. Um, I wanted order one in each bar, but that's obviously silly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so let me write it uh, better. So the commutator of. Uh, F and G is then I H bar bracket of F and G plus higher orders in H bar. So maybe that's the best way of saying it. Sorry, that was <laughs> not, not the best thing, thanks. <laughs> H bar is equal to one uh, in the uh, other context. Okay, so how do I want to construct this product? So this is what I want from deformation quantization. I want a product 
with these properties. And we are in free theory. So there is a nice prescription how to do this using uh, the Vial Moyal product. And this is here the recipe. So construction. So I define F star G as um, sum n equals zero to infinity. Um, so I want H bar to the n, n factorial, and here I'm going to take powers of some integral kernel, I will specify it in a minute, and contract it with derivatives of f and g. Okay, and uh, there is a nice notation for it with exponentials, so you can also write it as h bar uh, w d over d phi tensor d over d phi applied on f tensor g and then a multiplication operator at the end. So this emphasizes the fact that we are dealing with exponentials. All right, and what's that W? So I want W to have a I half as it's a I have delta as its anti-symmetric part. So delta itself is anti-symmetric. As this is morally speaking the Poisson by vector. And uh, now having this guarantees that, um, well here if I take h bar equals one, I just contract once here, so I have the first power of W, first derivative, first derivative. So that gives me exactly the bracket. After anti-symmetrization, I get the factor of two. So uh, having this as the anti-symmetric part is already fulfilling this property. The first property is kind of obvious by, uh, well, if I have h bar equal to zero, then I don't differentiate these at all. I don't contract, so I have just f times g. So this property is fine. But, 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 I cannot actually get away with just this because it turns out that the wavefront set of this uh, object uh, is not good enough, unfortunately. So it's okay to contract it with the first derivative of f and g, but it's not okay if I take powers and I take higher derivatives. So I have to add something, and this something has to be obviously symmetric, not to spoil that first property. So this is symmetric part. And I want to do it in such a way that the end result has nice wavefront set properties. So. The choice of this symmetric part has to be done in a careful way. So this W now has to satisfy the following. So this is really about the choice of the symmetric part. So first, I want this actually to be a bi-solution for uh, the uh, equations of motion operator. So this is a by solution um, for P. So this is equation of motion operator. And this is to guarantee that I can go on shell so that this star product will also be well defined after I go on shell. So there is that. 
two, well, this is more technical, but uh, I want this to actually uh, provide me a state uh, later on. So at the moment, I'm actually constructing a product, but for future convenience, it's important that uh, this object becomes a two-point function of a state. So for that reason, I ask for this to be positive definite. This positive definite. Okay. And three, I finally come to the wavefront set condition that would guarantee that all these guys are well defined. So three, uh, this is called microlocal spectrum condition. All right, and this says that the wavefront set of W, first instance, it would look like the wavefront set of delta, the first few uh, symbols. So this is two, 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 minus k prime, so that looks like the same thing in T star m squared. So that x k is again related to x prime k prime. However, there is an extra restriction that k is in the future light cone. So that's it. So what does it mean that the k is in the future light cone? So um, just from this wavefront set of um, delta, which I sort of sketched here, uh, I can have a situation that, uh, well, singular directions could fall into the future light cone or into the past light cone. With that extra condition, the singular directions would always only fall into the future light cone. And this is actually enough to guarantee that these powers would have well-defined uh, products with derivatives of microcausal functionals. So this means that uh, if I have these higher tensor products, I can only add things in the future light cone, so I will always end up in um, the directions which are again inside the future light cone. So, uh, that's the mathematical reason for that condition. There is the physical interpretation of that condition. Namely, this is a sort of generalization of the positive energy condition. So if I was on Minkowski space-time, I could talk about things like, uh, you know, spectrum of the momentum operators being uh, contained in the future light cone. That would be the positive energy condition. And this is sort of, uh, micro-local version of that. So there is a quite a nice story behind it. Okay, so with that, uh, what do I have? So now I have uh, a situation where this star product is well-defined. Now, how uh, unique is that choice? I mean, how many possible Ws I can find? Obviously, you know, it seems that there is a huge freedom in finding H such that these conditions are satisfied. Uh, and on curved space-time, this freedom corresponds to the freedom of uh, choosing a state on my theory. So W uh, has interpretation of A two-point function uh, actually the two-point function of a Hadamard state.
uh, Hadamard state is actually <laughs> quasi-free state, which is defined by a two-point function satisfying these properties. So, uh, you know, as a byproduct, you have already learned what's a Hadamard state. Um, yeah, I haven't convinced you really that W has something to do with the two-point function. So let's do it. Um, yeah, so what, what are the fields? What are the sort of, uh, you know, basic observables that, that you can uh, look at in quantum theory? So the first, first thing that comes to mind is, is just the linear field smeared with a test function. So let's take, take linear fields. Okay, so I'm going to use this very suggestive notation phi of f as a functional of a field configuration defined as taking that field configuration and smearing it with a test function with my favorite volume form. And let's take another one for g. Okay, so by G, oh dear, well, there's a bit of a uh, G uh, notation collision, so let's call it F prime. F prime, D mu, G, G is also the metric, so I don't want to use that letter. So F and F prime are uh, compactly supported functions on M, so these are the smeared fields. And let's see what we can do with them. So let's compute their star product. So F star G, okay, is a function of, oh yeah, let's put it later. So we have the first term, which is just the pointwise product. So this is phi of F pointwise phi of G, and then we have the first order in H bar, where we differentiate this ones, so that kills phi, we are left with F, and differentiate this ones, so that kills phi, we are left with F prime, and contract with W. So this is H bar times, and here we have W contracted with F tensor F prime, and now we run out of derivatives because fields are linear, so there is nothing else to be done. Okay, so that's a sort of, uh, well, almost the correlation of these two fields, but what I need is actually a state. So I need a way to uh, obtain numbers out of this game because I'm still left with functionals here. And an obvious state in this story is, uh, well, there's a family of obvious states, which are evaluations, okay? Everything is a functional, so we can always evaluate it at any point in my configuration space, we get a number. And uh, a natural point to evaluate things is zero, because uh, the space of sections is a vector space, so we can evaluate at a zero section. So take a state, or this state given by evaluation at, at zero. So what do we have? So evaluation zero of a functional f is f of zero. Let's use that state for um, Yes? Oh, sure. Yeah, um, so guess what happened to me <laughs> last weekend? Uh, how, how long is that? Uh, oh, but, but may maybe we should all go and... because this is the most exciting bit. I mean, we cannot just... <laughs> it's a, it's a, I, I, leave, I leave you guys with a, with a cliffhanger. <laughs> um, yeah, so...
So back online. Uh, okay, so let's continue this. That's a good one. So I have the state, which is given by evaluation at zero, and now I can apply this state to uh, the product of two fields. So evaluation at zero of f star, ooh, oh, 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 ah, I noticed, okay. That should be a prime, right? To be consistent with what I wrote before, of course. Uh, star f prime. Okay, so that's this guy. So if I evaluate at zero, okay, these guys evaluated at zero give zero linear. You know, so what I'm left with is h bar and here w f times f prime. Okay, so that justifies the name two-point function, okay, because it's a correlation between two linear fields. And uh, I can also put more things into the game, and I can compute endpoint functions. So uh, these various higher powers of, of W would correspond to endpoint functions. And, and you notice that, okay, so if I have uh, odd, uh, product of, of fields, then evaluate at zero, I will end up always with zero because not all the phi's are contracted. So I only have even uh, endpoint functions and they are all given by some uh, powers of W. So think of W as a two-point function. Um, so I have quantized the free theory. So I have reached the level of sophistication that uh, you know, quantum field theory is at, uh, at least in the rigorous sense. And now we can try to uh, do something slightly more interesting and introduce the interaction. So uh, what I said before, I was already talking about formal power series. I could do that story uh, rigorously, non-perturbatively, but uh, it's actually, uh, at the moment, not possible to do the fourth part of the story, so the interaction, non-perturbatively. So I have to deal with formal power series. Uh, in the first approach, I will uh, restrict to functionals that are um, better than this, so that are, um, less singular. So for today's lecture, restrict to regular functionals. Ah, so F regular. And I recall this means that all the derivatives are smooth for all n in n and pi in e. So I'm going to do that because I want to, uh, well, lay out the algebraic right structures before actually getting into a uh, renormalization business. So let's start here. Uh, with the interruptions, how much time do I have? I lost count of that. 40 minutes, okay, so we end at 10.2. Okay, good. So, let's start. Uh, you already heard about time-ordered products from uh, Frederic, so you're going to recognize, hopefully, what I'm going to tell you now. So, the first object, uh, so, Everything here is on F regular formal power series. So the first object is the time ordering operator. The 
which I denote by T, okay? And this is defined as follows. So T is the exponential of an operator that takes uh, some mysterious guy, mysterious guy called the Feynman propagator and contracts it with the second derivative. Okay, Feynman propagator, where delta F is I half delta retarded plus delta advanced plus H. So that's the same H we had with the two-point function, and this is the Feynman propagator. Note that I'm working in this uh, situation where my spacetime could be um, any globally hyperbolic manifold. So here when I say Feynman propagator, I really mean the Feynman propagator associated to my choice of the two-point function. So I made a choice here for the star product, and then this implies what the choice for the Feynman propagator is going to be. But it's not only on Minkowski, this works also on curved spacetime. So that's the formula. And let's think about what it does, okay? So it's very useful to sort of have a picture of how this acts. So, so this is actually contracting pairs of field configurations with delta F. So the way I like to think about it is I have this Feynman propagator associated with a line. Let me make a bit more room. And then at the end, I have derivatives with respect to pi. So when I apply this T, I end up uh, contracting various field configurations pairwise. So that's the first definition. And now this defines me a product. So I have my classical pointwise product. I use this guy to construct the time ordered product. So definition, the time ordered Product T is defined by F time ordered G is the deformation or maybe a twist of the pointwise product. So this is T e minus one. G. So you can see it's a commutative product equivalent to the pointwise product. Um, there is also another way to express it, also given by I could write it in terms of these exponential operators. So I have multiplication. Um, composed with uh, the other half there, which is good. So H bar delta F, and then D over D phi, answer D over D phi, applied on F, answer G. So I can uh, now compare it with the definition of the star product, you see, it's, it's the same thing, only that here I had uh, W as the kernel, and here I have delta F. So they are very uh, similar creatures. And because of the relations between them and the fact that 
retarded and advanced propagators have certain support properties, uh, there is a sort of causality relation that relates time ordered product with the star product. So it justifies the name time ordered. So, uh, note, and this follows from these properties of my propagators, is that f time ordered g coincides with f star g when, well, if support of g falls no later than the support of f. So if we have this situation, we have some Cauchy surface separating g from f. Or it's the other way around. If these things happen to be arranged in the other ordering. So, so this is really the time ordered version of um, the star product. <laughs> okay, any questions for now? And there is yet another way of thinking about this time ordered product just to connect to other things you might know. Uh, it's also related to the path integral. So a lot of uh, QFT combinatorics comes from the path integral that you may or may not want to take seriously as an integral. Um, but definitely we all deal with the same combinatorics if we are working in quantum field theory or quantum field theory inspired mathematics. So uh, formally, we have that this time ordering applied to F at the configuration psi formally, so I put quotation marks so that you don't think that I'm talking serious mathematics here, can be seen as a convolution with a Gaussian measure d mu with the covariance given by this Feynman propagator. So this is uh, then long chalk Gaussian measure. Measure with covariance delta F. But again, this cannot be taken too seriously in Lorentzian signature because uh, we cannot really make sense of that measure, but we can make sense of that operator. So uh, you can think of a path integral as a good heuristic motivation for many uh, properties of the time ordering operator and time ordered product. So you can translate all your favorite formulas you know from a path integral to this context. Okay, should finish the process of cleaning. Again, because it's a cleaning break, I can pause for questions. Questions? Yes. Oh, uh, it's here. A Hadamard state is a quasi-free state, so all the endpoint functions are power of the two-point function, where the two-point function satisfies these properties. This is the definition of a Hadamard state. Good call because I'm going to erase it. But uh, yeah, that's, that's actually really the definition.
Okay. And this one. So now, with that time-ordered product at hand, I can introduce the formal S matrix, which is one of the main tools in Epstein Glaser. So another definition are uh, the formal S matrix. is defined. by the following, so S of lambda D, so lambda is now going to be the coupling constant, so coupling, cost, coupling constant, constant, which mathematically will become another formal parameter, so another Homo parameter. So we had h bar. Now there's also going to be lambda. And this is defined as the time ordered exponential of i over h bar lambda time ordered v. Um, so V here for now is assumed to be uh, a regular functional, so we can think of it as some interaction term. And applying this T is sort of uh, choosing the ordering. So we are taking V, which is time ordered. This is choice of ordering of ordering. Okay, and then we take the time ordered exponential. So by time ordered exponential, I mean exponential where the product is the time ordered product. Uh, so what is this animal? Well, we have some uh, powers, negative powers of h bar here, but in the definition of t, as you can see, we have positive powers of h bar. So this ends up being uh, a Laurent series in h bar um, and the formal power series in lambda. So uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so Laurent series in h bar with coefficient in formal power series in lambda. Or in other words, you can say, um, Formal power series in h bar and lambda over h bar. That's also a way to say it. Okay, so we have these things to play with. So for that situation, we can now uh, use those S matrices to construct interacting fields. And the motivation comes from uh, something called the Dyson series. So motivation from physics. So this is Dyson series. Prescription or formula for, for the interacting fields. Okay, so uh, in this framework, so I want to construct uh, interacting fields, okay, so I have some free theory given by um, Lagrangian L0, so free theory that's given by some L0, and then I have interaction V, 
So in full theory is is given by L0 plus V. And now I want to construct um, well observables in that theory. So let's put that up. So observables interacting observables are given by the following prescription. So if F regular is a classical observable, And then the interacting one is given by this formula. So RV of F, this is the interacting observable, is S of V, the minus one, star S of V plus, um, I need more letters. Uh, let's make it T uh, times F. And I want to take the linear order of that. So D over DT of that at T equals zero. So before taking the linear order, this object is called the relative S matrix. S matrix. And that linear order of the relative S matrix, so this RV is called the retarded Miller operator. Okay, so the philosophy here is to uh, slightly perturb your interaction by some given observable and then uh, look at the relative S matrix and then look at uh, the first order of that. Now, <coughs> we still have maybe enough time to say a bit more about this. So let me uh, try to convince you that this has something to do with interactive fields in the way you might have seen it in uh, QFT textbooks. So maybe first let's spell out this uh, S of V that was just the time ordered exponential uh, I over H bar time ordered V. So now I spell out was the time ordered exponential. So is the time ordering applied to the ordinary exponential i over h bar. Um, I should carry this coupling constant, but I really don't want to. So uh, imagine that v is always multiplied with a coupling constant because it's a notational mess. So let's absorb the coupling constant into v. Uh, so that's that. And now I want to spell out uh, this whole thing. So then R V of F is really uh, this time ordered exponential two minus one, okay, star. Uh, and now we have T, we have to perturb by F take the derivative we know how to differentiate exponentials. So this is time ordered the exponential times, this is ordinary times F. Okay, so this maybe still doesn't look like anything, 
But now let's think about it heuristically. Sorry, yes. And what, what would that be? Uh, so the product shells, yeah. Oh yeah, 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 like that. Yes, yes, that is true. The the time ordered product of two time ordered exponentials is a time ordered exponential. But the star product, ah, uh, no, no, that's complicated. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I guess one can work it out. Uh, I mean, it would be some, yeah, it, it would be something complicated because, uh, yeah, this, these products have very different structure, but yeah, I mean, it, in special cases, you, 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 you know what that is, but uh, yeah, it's okay. It, I, I will look into this. So, so you say that there is a, maybe a way to, to do it nicely with, okay, good, you have to tell me. Because yeah, so otherwise, this is this is a real mess. Uh, cool. Okay. So what is this guy? So there is this heuristic formula with the path integral. So now forget rigor. Okay, put the rigor aside. So what's this? So this is uh, ah, and you know what? Let's evaluate everything at zero. So evaluation at zero of that whole thing. So here, evaluate at zero of that. So we have that path integral of E i h bar v d mu i h bar delta f. So morally speaking, <coughs> this would be, the integrand would be i over h bar v plus l zero and here you would have the uh, pi whatever that means and from this term we would have the path integral of e i over h bar again very heuristically v plus l zero times f uh, and then d phi uh, and so the whole thing is uh, again, there is the star product in between, but uh, forgetting that in some situations, you can actually factorize it so that the right hand side becomes this exponential over that. So this really looks like the Dyson formula for the interacting fields. So this is then Dyson formula. Yeah. Oh no, this is this is the star inverse. This is the inverse with respect to star. So it's it's you take the time ordered product and then uh you take the inverse of that with respect to the star product. <laughs> well, let's see. So, uh, yes, because, well, yeah, for for local V, this is unitary. So then this would be the anti-time ordered integral. So yes, that's correct. For, for, for local arguments. For, for non-local arguments, it's not necessarily true because the unitarity fails. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a good, good point. Um, Okay, so that's the Dyson formula, which, I mean, it's kind of comforting that you get something that at least looks like a quantum field theory after you put enough interpretation on your formulae. Um, yeah, one more thing. Uh, I still have uh, 15 minutes, is that right? Okay, so. Another cleaning break.
right? Maybe that goes as last. Or actually, maybe not. I don't think I will need all of them. Okay, so back to the plot. Uh, I hope I convinced you somewhat that we are actually doing quantum field theory. Uh, and last but not least, there is a nice property for these S matrices, which I'm going to build up on. So, uh, note. So, so that relation between star products and time ordered products I gave before, so the sort of causality property gives the following. So S satisfies as another uh, version of this Hammerstein property. So take V1 and V2 such that support V1 is disjoint from support V2. So then the S matrix uh, factorizes. Actually, let's make uh, this even more concrete. So that's uh, support V1 is not to the past of support V2. So this relation means not to the past. And um, well, in practice, it means that uh, if I take V1 and I take uh, V2, then support of V1 does not intersect the past of the support V2. So that means not to the past. There is also not to the future. Um, so I don't need. So support V1 is not to the past of the support of V2. So they could be future, but they could also be space-like. And then I have the following. So I have S of V1 plus V star s of v minus one star s of v plus v two and this is called causal factorization property so this is causal factorization property Okay, and you can see if you compare with uh, what I had before for uh, Lagrangians, this is uh, very similar, only on the right-hand side, uh, you have a multiplicative structure, but you also have this sort of uh, split into three terms. Uh, 
And now I want to tell you how this is actually related to locality uh, in the sense of algebraic quantum field theory. So uh, the sort of linear Hammerstein property was related to locality in the sense of locality of functionals. This is actually related to uh, AQFT-like locality. So uh, let's now go back to the first lecture yesterday. I said about the AQFT axioms and about a special property for things that are localized in space-like regions. So let's take V1 and V2 that are actually localized in space-like regions. So take support V1 space-like to support V2. What does it mean? It means that uh, V1 is not to the past of V2, but also V2 is not to the past of V1. So we have in particular support V1 is greater or equal of V2, but we also have opposite direction. Um, yes. And now let's take V equals zero in that uh, property. So the causal factorization property implies that S of V1 plus V2 for V equals zero, we don't have the middle term. So we have one direction of things. So we have one factorization and then we have uh, another factorization. But we also can apply this in the opposite order. So this is S of V2 star S of V1, okay? So the last move tells me that S of V1 and S of V2 commute. So S of V1 commutes with S of V2. Okay? And this is the locality a la uh, AQFT axioms. So this is what I mean by locality. Okay, so what I can do is I can define my local algebras um, as being generated by these S matrices. So idea, so define A of O is the algebra generated with respect to star by these uh, S of V where uh, support V is contained in O. So this is a prescription to uh, construct such local algebras. Um, so this is still a bit lacking, okay? Uh, we have some ingredients, but we are missing a very important piece here, uh, namely renormalization, okay? I, I talked almost one hour now about interacting uh, quantum field theory. I haven't mentioned the renormalization. Uh, and, and this is because at the very beginning, I restricted myself to, myself to uh, regular interactions, okay? So that was, um, well, for a good reason. So now what I want is to be able to describe um, these, describe interactions which are local, 
Why? Because in particle physics, all these nice things like phi to the four of phi cube and so on, and the standard model and QED and everything we're actually interested in is local. So my clever idea for constructing these local algebras, you know, despite all these nice properties is actually flawed because uh, I cannot describe local interactions. Okay, that's terrible. So the problem, so we want V to be local. But the only local and regular functionals are what? Okay, so all the derivatives have to be uh, smooth. So it's true for constant. It's true for uh, linear things. We have seen that already. Uh, is it true for quadratic? No, not really, because if you take uh, the derivative of a quadratic functional, your uh, second derivative picks up a delta. So the only local and regular functionals are linear. So the only interactions that I could describe uh, here rigorously uh, up to now are linear interactions, which is uh, okay, a bit underwhelming. So I have to do something, and this is where epstein glasser renormalization comes in. So the epstein glasser renormalization is a way to extend that whole business to the situation where we have local interactions. So um, this problem is the renormalization problem. So the solution is renormalize things. So renormalization. Renormalization problem. Okay, so this is extend time ordered products, products to uh, local arguments. This is achieved by Epstein Glaser. renormalization. Okay, so I will devote my last lecture to actually performing that trick, so I will take these time ordered products I uh, introduced today and renormalize them. Um, I think my time is up. Questions for Kasia? When I think of those S then as forming a group, so first, right? With respect to this. Uh, yes, with respect to this star product. Yes, so uh, in fact, for local interactions, this would be uh, the, uh, the unitary operators, so to say. This would be the group of unitaries. Yeah, so there is there is a more abstract way of, of doing things non-perturbatively. You would uh, um, you could also define local algebras as sister algebras uh, of a group of unitaries given by those S matrices. So yeah. Ooh, oh, the yeah. Well, the algebra is uh, okay. It's all a bit uh, complicated because this would be like a very infinite dimensionally group. Uh, so, uh, but okay. I mean, sure, you you can think of it as infinite dimensionally group. Um, yeah. So one can consider it's the algebra. I've never 
looked at it actually, but uh, in principle you can do this. 